the um, colleague mentioned, I work at the Aboriginal Medical Service. I'm a senior staff specialist at the local health district. I also work at the Kempsey Jail. Um, became an addiction specialist through the Foundation Fellowship because it was uh, a fairly new specialty, maybe you know. I come from a GP background like a lot of people here, and before that I was an ophthalmologist in Germany. Um, got to Australia to work with Fred Hollows back in the early 80s, and um, got interested in Aboriginal health, and that led me into addictions medicine over the years, so it's a bit convoluted, but um, um, I enjoy my work, and it's good fun, and lots of variety, and lots of challenges. Nothing compares to, to this challenge. The only reason I feel a bit nervous probably yesterday, today and tomorrow repeating this uh, presentation is because it's ice. Um, give me treatment of heroin anytime or even cannabis or alcohol. I'm so familiar with it, but ice is a, is a real challenge and you probably all know that. Um, and the only time, another first, the only time I'm, I agree with politicians is this time with the word scourge. I don't, I think they all is bullshit, but they have used, one of the politicians used the word scourge to describe ice and somehow I agree with this. At the time I thought it's um, an exaggeration and a bit of a, a hype, a media hype, but it is true, it's, it, it is a real, real worry, real concern. Um, uh, I must start by saying I give credit a lot of some of these slides come from the Australian Drug Foundation work on on ICE, uh, which is uh, open open source. Anybody can go to their website and have a look at them. Um, some of the stats, just because they've done a lot of studies and 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 studied it, um, and they gave us the the figures that you will see in a minute. So amphetamines. Um, come in these three groups. Um, the base, if you like, is, is the oily, um, unrefined stuff. Uh, the one in the middle, it's about 21% purity. The powder before that is, um, is even less pure, but then we've got the, the methamphetamine, the crystalline methamphetamine, which is 80% pure. Um, I, um, there are, there's dexamphetamine that we use for treatment. The psychiatrists give uh, two kids to, um, to treat ADHD and um, the other chemicals. I'll mention them in a minute. So this is sort of a classification, one of the classifications. Um, I add to them um, Ritalin and Modafinil. Ritalin is used in ADHD as well. Modafinil is a, is a stimulant that um, is used in narcolepsy, you know, the, the disease that make people drop asleep out of, it almost paralyzes them and they go to sleep. So it keeps people awake. And there's lots of research now being done to use these two substances, um, including desamphetamine and the treatment of ice addiction uh, as a replacement, if you like. It'll, it'll come in a minute. I uh, personally like to add cocaine and MDMA, ecstasy, to, to the same group because they're all part of the stimulant group, although there are differences, of course. Um, for example, ecstasy gives more of a, um, of a happy feeling. It's more an oxytocin sort of feeling, a love. They call it the drug of love, where everybody around you seems to be beautiful and loving, uh, as well as being stimulated. So there's a stimulant effect mainly, but also the, um, the, the, the euphoric effect. Um, cocaine, cocaine is a good example of um, of, of how drugs get, um, get misused and abused. Uh, you know, um, it came from South America, especially Bolivia and so on, where the farmers there, traditionally the indigenous people, um, chew the coca leaf. The leaf from the, from the coca plant has got um, a small amount of cocaine in it. All they have to do is chew it and keep it in their mouth and, and, and suck on it all day long. And they can go up and climb the steep Andes mountain all day long and they can work hard, they don't get hungry, they don't get thirsty and, and all the energy comes out of them. But they do that very slowly in a, in a, in a controlled manner the whole day and um, they go back home and they probably have a really good sleep after that. It's only when the Westerners came and, and, and wanted more and wanted that initial hit and the effect and they were able to extract the cocaine out of it and made it into strong white expensive powder that uh, that it became a, a problem. Um, I'm happy to say that in our area there's hardly any cocaine, probably because the price is, um, 
is still very high, so most people in, in, in um, rural reg regional areas can't really afford it. Once you leave the big cities, um, not many people are um, able to afford it. So we, I've, I've hardly seen any cocaine except people who have come from Sydney and so on that, that visited Port Macquarie and, um, and possibly pilots and so on that had a problem with it. Um, but um, let's always remember, bef just like Linda said, that uh, ice is always used in combination with other drugs. Uh, I've hardly ever seen a patient who uses ice who has, um, has not been using other drugs uh, at the same time. Um, I'm going to now start by telling you about this one patient I saw on Tuesday at, at Dari Aboriginal Medical Service, 21-year-old, beautiful young woman who has been using cannabis since she was 13 and ice for the last three years. So she was 18 when she started using ice. At the moment, her habit for both of them is, was costing her, is costing her about $300 a day. Um, I have a registrar sitting with me I had on that day, and I had a medical student sitting. The first question after she left, you can guess where the question, where, where, where does she get the money for that? Um, she came for help, asking for help. The only worry, and it's wonderful, I had, you know, did what I can do, um, is the only worry is that she was sent to me by her probation officer. So she is a coerced patient. I just wonder whether she, if she had not been under the probation and parole system, whether she would have come anyway. But uh, she openly said that her crime, she's going to court and so on, whatever she's done is related to her, to her drug use, especially the ice, she calls it. She said this is what sent, got her to, um, uh, in trouble with the law and she might go to jail and so on, but now she's trying to do something for it. So just one little example. So, um, so these um, substances, uh, the first thing they do is they, they make the brain produce these really strong heavy duty neurotransmitters, especially dopamine and noradrenaline. Um, these substances are responsible for attention, for behavior for um, brain function, it's the, the blood flow in the brain um, accelerates and people become full of energy, full of um, uh, uh, positivity, they, their tiredness goes away, their hunger goes away and they, uh, and they can um, function at a much higher level as you could imagine. Um, the trouble is the repeated use with time, it's almost like the brain gets depleted of, of dopamine and, and, and noradrenaline. Um, it, it looks like a seesaw really, especially with their mood and with their, um, with their energy and with their, people go up and then they come down. And because it's short acting, within one or two days, they, they drop down and then they use again, they go up and come down again. But definitely over the months or years, the general trend is down. So they do have up and down in, in, in their mood and energy level and so on, but the, in the end, there's, there's a definite drop. Um, but this is why it's so addictive, because they feel, they feel really, really bad. They feel um, lethargic, tired, depressed. They feel like shit, really, in the end. And they, so the easiest way is just take another pill or shoot up or snort. Or, um, amphetamines can be, uh, that's the other wonderful thing about them, that they can be taken in all different ways. They can be taken um, intravenously, they can be snorted, uh, they can be smoked, or taken orally. Some people throw it and they drink. Uh, thank you very much, bit of vodka, bit of ice, and, and they drink it. In that case, it takes a bit longer to start working, maybe a half an hour or 45 minutes, but otherwise it's almost instant. Even smoking it is, is almost instantaneous. Snorting takes a bit longer, a few minutes, maybe 15 minutes to, to start working. Uh, bit of history, uh, really interesting to see that uh, uh, amphetamine was uh, uh, synthesized back in the 1880s. That's how long ago it is. In, in Japan, it was used in, um, in 1919, uh, it was developed Methamphetamine then was developed in 1919, um, and then um, I think at one stage it was used in medicine, it was used in psychiatry, similar to the other hallucinogenic drugs, uh, which were used in psychiatry to make people uh, talk and uh, 
come on, and, and was used as an antidepressant as well at some stage, apparently. Um, definitely used in wars to keep pilots awake and functioning well, even in the Second World War. Um, it was also definitely used in the Vietnam War. The American um, soldiers used it a lot, as well as heroin. Heroin was rampant, and cannabis in Vietnam, apparently, but, uh, but uh, amphetamine was used. And there's rumors, I don't know how true it is, that, it was, that amphetamines were supplied to the to the pilots and, and to the soldiers. Don't know. Um, the problematic use only started in the 60s and 70s. Um, and then it was controlled and illegalized. And um, in the 2000s, we started seeing ice in Australia. And now it's become a scourge. Um, this is really interesting. Look at the alcohol graph. And cannabis comes second, of course. Ecstasy and cocaine relatively common. I was a bit surprised to see these figures, but they're sort of equivalent to the methamphetamine. So the, the brown line is lifetime use. So anybody who's used it ever in Australia, there's about one in 15 Australians have used it once. Surprising. So there will be about three or four of us here have used it. Put your hands up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. I uh, might have smoked cannabis in the past and inhaled, uh, unlike Bill Clinton, but I definitely wouldn't go here uh, when I was young and silly. Uh, okay, uh, but 2% of Australians have used it recently in the past 12 months. This um, survey, by the way, happens every three years, and it's a phone survey, a random survey for, to people above 14, and uh, about 40,000 people are rung up and called, and they ask them about the drug use. So it's quite, quite a significant one, and it comes every three years. I don't have the uh, 2016 figures, but um, we think it's gone up definitely for amphetamines. It may not have come up. What they're telling us is that the total number of people using amphetamines all up has not gone up much, uh, but we know that it has. But mostly what happened is maybe people have moved from the powder or the base to the, to the crystal form. So more people proportionately are using methamphetamine. Why is that? Because the quality is better, it's higher, it's become much more potent. The potency has doubled over the three years and the price has dropped. It's very cheap. The Aboriginal woman, I told you, she spent so much money, she told me that she uses two or three points per day. A point is a tenth of a gram. In Sydney, you can buy the gram now for $300. In Kempsey, Port Coffs Harbour, probably five, $600 if you buy the whole gram at once. So the price has come down. But, we're not sure, uh, but if you buy it um, in points, if you buy a point at a time, you may pay 80 or $100 per point, which is almost $1,000, 800 to $1,000 for a gram. It sounds like very expensive, but people use very little of it. They need very little of it, and they get a real big hit. It's almost cheaper than cannabis. Cannabis has come down also in price, and the quality has gone up. But over the last 30 years, 40 years, um, I know that um, when I came to Australia 35 years ago in 81, uh, the the ounce of cannabis was about <coughs> three, four hundred dollars. Now it's still three, four hundred dollars. After 35 years, so you imagine the inflation, it beat the inflation, and the quality has gone up. Cannabis has become also a bit more potent. But here, it's is a real concern. Um, I keep talking about other drugs and to remind you that ice is not isolated. It's always combined with other drugs, especially alcohol. People love to drink. and. They, um, they think they can drink more and party longer if they took ice with, with the drink. Um, so um, people are switching from ordinary speed to ice. Um, this is interesting that only 30% of people who use ice use it regularly, about once weekly or once daily. Only 30%, it's quite a lot, but there's 70% of them who use it recreationally sometimes. Um, that would lead us to think that it's not very addictive. The 70% of people who use it don't get addicted to it. Yes, 
probably, but it is very addictive because 30% of people are. There's research was done in America, and I've got quotes of it here, that says that amphetamine isn't as addictive as alcohol or tobacco, but I want to refute that. Um, I've got the figures here of that research, and I can give you the, the source. It's really interesting to me because um, just my experience and, and logic tells me that ice is very addictive. They say here that um, ice is similar to cannabis. Only um, one in 10 of people who use it get addicted to it. But this figure tells us it's three out of 10. But um, they say that tobacco is um, one in three. So a third of all tobacco users get addicted to it. I think it's higher than that. It's almost uh, nine out of 10. But uh, one in five people who use heroin get addicted to heroin. And one in eight people who drink alcohol get addicted to alcohol. That sounds right. There's about 10% of Australian drinkers have a dependency on alcohol. It probably all these um, different figures are probably because of the definition of dependence. What is dependence? And you probably know. So the definition might be a little bit gray and not quite sharp. But uh, anyway, let's remember that only 30% of, of users use it regularly. Um, and only 10 to 15 percent of them use it that often, really, really frequently. The heaviest users are in this age group, 20 to 29. The next, uh, the next biggest um, uh, group is uh, 30 to 39. Um, they say here, I'm going to read a bit, that um, uh, the ice use has doubled from 22 to 50 percent of, of the people who use ice uh, in the last three years from the previous survey to this one. So it used to be 22, now it's 50%. Um, and the recent use of, of speed, ordinary speed, has dropped to half. Um, the uh, use of methamphetamine has become more frequent. People use it more frequently. And um, the quality has gone up, and, uh, and, and the price has gone down. Um, it is twice as commonly used in people who use other drugs, so that's almost a, a factor in itself, the other drug use, as I said earlier. People who are unemployed or don't work, more likely to use. People in remote areas, rural areas, we do have a higher rate of use here. I know that it's higher than in Sydney, maybe because more Sydney siders use uh, cocaine than, I don't know, and, and it's higher in, um, in the gay community. Uh, it's, it's almost a party drug. It's, um, you know, compared to, to heroin and, and cannabis, they're stupid drugs. They're called stupid drugs. You know, they make you mellow and you get tired and go to sleep. And alcohol is becoming sort of, but this is why they, they use ice. It's, and, and especially MDMA and the newer drugs, GHB and all the, the new party drugs. It gets people up and, and they're alert and they dance all night and, and they engage in, in risky behavior. IV drug use and unprotected sex. I was last week in, in Sydney in a, um, in a workshop um, organized by the College of Sexual Health Medicine. And um, there seems to be evidence now that there's a real link between ice use and HIV reinfection or infection, new, new, um, uh, newly acquired HIV uh, in, um, in people who use ice. And both of these are quite common in the gay community. Uh, so there is a link there. Uh, the police tells us that the seizures they've been catching um, uh, has, has gone up. Uh, so in, um, in 2012, there was, um, uh, just read that, 50% of crystal methamphetamine had a purity of 10%. In 2014, so after three years, um, it's gone up from 10% to 80%, the purity of the ice that the police have seized. It's horrific. In the hospitals, this is interesting, that um, in, in 13, 14, the year 13, 14, only one in 1,000 hospital admissions, one in 10,000, sorry, hospital admi admissions in New South Wales had ice use related to them, but um, the, the um, emergency department presentations where methamphetamine was recorded went up sevenfold in, um, in the five years to 2014, sevenfold. So people who came to the emergency department, they might have come due to something else, but when ICE was involved, 
seven times in five years, it's gone up by sevenfold. So it is going up, and I, this is why I do believe the word scourge is, is true. And I told you about the price, anywhere between $300 for a gram and $1,000, but it's close to 500 probably. So this is just repeating what I just said. I'll switch this off. Okay. Um, higher in the jail population, uh, presentations to the, to the hospitals, um, and the age group becoming younger. I added GABA, gamma, gamma amino butyric acid here. It's actually the opposite. It does opposite effect to the other three. I just want to put it there. It's, it's more uh, an inhibitor, new, neurotransmitter. It slows people down. It's the one that is involved in alcohol and benzodiazepines. It relaxes you. So it works almost opposite to the others, but um, it's, it's all these chemicals that run in our brains to either um, make us function or think or have good memory or have good mood or, or uh, make decisions or um, adapt to change, all that frontal lobe thing, and, and all relax us like the GABA is. Um, and these are the um, centers in the brain that are responsible for these. This is quite an interesting list um, of each neurotransmitter and what they do. You can read it yourself, but um, look at the middle one, the noradrenaline. I'm interested in that. This is why people love it. They, they, they love um, fast cars. They love to go to, um, to, to the Big Dipper and, and uh, get their heartbeats or um, uh, do skydiving and so on because of the adrenaline. We all, we all often thrive on adrenaline. While, while I'm working during the day, I feel that I'm all excited and good and I'm not tired. I get home and I crash. Adrenaline, and I think adrenaline and noradrenaline are the best antidepressants there is. If, you, if you're depressed and worried and tired, all you want is a shot of adrenaline and you would feel on top of the world. And this is why people like using ice. A lot of ice users, and especially those who depend on it, have got mental health issues. A lot of them are depressed. They are bored. Boredom is a big thing. They usually don't work. Uh, a lot of them had childhood trauma. It's a big, big issue. If we start delving in their past, you will find a lot of especially sexual trauma. Um, you almost can't blame them for wanting to use ice. Uh, usually using it once doesn't make you addicted to it, but if you use it once, you would, you're more likely to want to use it again and again. So the nature of the drug itself is really important. It, it sort of makes you, it gives you a reward and you want more of it, but also the, the person themselves and their, their own um, uh, mood and, and brain function and especially depression. I hear it a lot. I, I sit and talk to the people and I say, well, what does it do to you? What, what, um, I, I'm trying not to um, judge it and I say, how, how do you feel? Why, wh why do you like using it? Often, the first thing I hear all the time is it gives me energy. I can get up and do the lawn. I can get up and clean the house. I have another young Aboriginal woman in, my, um, in the methadone program, and she's doing so well on methadone, but she keeps coming back with ice. And she says, if I don't use it, I, I will have no, I won't be able to do the housework. She's got kids, and she's got a house to look after and she needs the energy. She got herself to the point. She got to the point where she needs to use ice to get energy. But it's the best antidepressant. It just picks you up, gives you a go. And people love it. Uh, so these are the immediate effects um, with a low dose or a higher dose. You see the low dose, it's all very, um, very positive, isn't it? Gives you confidence, makes you alert, motivated, you start talking. Uh, and you don't eat as much. I need it sometimes. <laughs> this is why, you know, when we're anxious and working hard and, and, and excited, we don't eat, we, we don't get hungry. It's only when we relax. But um, it's then the higher doses that cause problems or rep the repeated dose. People increase, like all drugs, especially with ice and heroin and so on, people increase the dose, it escalates. Uh, otherwise, it won't get to the same effect. This is the definition of dependence, is that uh, keeping the same dose will uh, 
will decrease the effect. So you need to increase the dose to get to the same effect. That's how your brain get, uh, get tolerant to it. Um, so people um, use more and more. And if once uh, they use um, a hit that's very pure, that's stronger than what they usually have, they could go into an overdose. And they can have these symptoms uh, up to getting a stroke or a seizure. That's quite common. It does happen. Um, people hallucinate, and they go into psychosis. Drug-induced psychosis can happen almost from any drug, but usually it's amphetamines that cause it. Some people get it even from cannabis, but a much higher rate of drug-induced psychosis comes from, um, from amphetamines, um, obviously. Uh, we had um, a woman uh, in Port Macquarie Hospital. I usually work in Kempsey, not much in Port, but I was called to see her, and that she was transferred later to Kempsey. Um, not very old, in her 30s, young and strong and, and, and muscular. She overdosed on ice in the emergency department in Kempsey. She was heavily sedated and then transferred to Port Macquarie Hospital. She was in intensive care for four days, intubated and sedated artificially because they couldn't uh, restrain her initially. There were four strong men trying to restrain her, and they couldn't. So they had to um, uh, sedate her, um, uh, anesthetize her, and, and intubate her. And she ended up in intensive care just through ice use. That's all it is. And it's a true story. Um, psychosis is very, very important, very um, interesting, and the hallucination. Some people go into a drug-induced psychosis and come out of it, and they're obviously not psychotic people. They do recover this. So the definition of drug-induced psychosis is that you do come out of it. Otherwise, people who stay in it, obviously, they're schizophrenics. Maybe they were undiagnosed schizophrenics or were still functioning. They were um, preclinical, if you like. Uh, the ice has tipped them over the edge and put them into psychosis, and they don't come out of it, and they need permanent treatment, long-term treatment. So there's that link between uh, mental health and drug and alcohol. And as you know, there's a huge overlap between our field and the mental health field. And, um, uh, and this is one of them. Um, so what happens with the crash? Uh, people, um, it's usually after a day or two. So if people had a binge, um, they can go stay in it two or three days, and then they crash. And the crash lasts two or three days. It's not long. The, the actual withdrawal from, from a big ice use is, um, is actually longer than alcohol and, and heroin. It can go for up to 10 days. The actual effect on the brain, though, can go up to six months. We have people in treatment who have stopped many, many weeks ago, and that's the long-term treatment. So there's the detoxification period and then the treatment period for those people who use big amounts and, 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 and long-term. But this is, this is just the crash. This is just the, the initial period. They can't sleep. They eat a little bit more. They crave the drug. They, and um, and uh, initially, they can't sleep. But then they sleep for two or three days. And then they wake up. And they're still awake. And they, they're, um, they, their brain goes on and on. But their body is exhausted. And aches and pains and so on. Um, these are the long-term effects which is quite understandable, like any drug, just the opposite effects of the drug. Um, so poor memory, depression is very, very common, and anxiety, uh, psychotic symptoms, aggressive agitation, weight loss, dependent chest pain. They have um, uh, dental problems, skin problems. You've heard of the, the reason for those skin sores and stuff that, that you know, with, with amphetamines is uh, um, people become uh, oversensitized. The skin uh, feels very, very sensitive, um, hypersensitive, and uh, they feel um, creepy crawlies, just like the alcohol withdrawal, except this one goes for longer. So they scratch a lot, and they get sores, they get infected. Um, the last point is that because of the dopamine being overproduced and then depleted with repeated use is they have early Parkinsonian disease believe it or not, um, if they use it long enough. One of them, 
But uh, depression and anxiety is the most common one, and the mood swings are very common, even after they stop using. You will see that, it, I mean, that's one thing we really need to ask for, how's your mood and how's your swings, because we can do something about it. In treatment, uh, I'll show you what <coughs> pharmacotherapy we give, but one of the things you can give is mood stabilizers. And um, we found, especially in Port Macquarie, I've got a very, very clever, um, experienced nurse who um, says, here, Faris, here, I think for this patient, we want to give him a bit of Valpro, we want to give him Epilim. Uh, he loves Epilim, the nurse does. Uh, a very small dose, just 100 milligrams twice a day. You know, like full-on Epilim for an, for an epileptic goes up to 1,000 or 2,000 milligrams. But um, here, 100 milligrams twice a day, even once a day, but probably twice a day for a long period is quite useful. Um, obviously, you have to watch the effects of, of Valproate and so on, but uh, it helps that up and down mood swings, helps them relax a little bit more. And um, So um, as mentioned, um, the withdrawal can go up to 10 days, uh, and slowly it subsides. But People tell you their sleep pattern and their mood and so on can take months to come back. Obviously, it depends how often they used it and how long for and, and the amount and so on. Um, the fatigue, the muscle tension, poor concentration and uh, mood goes up and down, and like we said. Um, so this is the period. These are the people who need treatment. These are the ones that... The occasional user that stops after a short time, they probably just need support and so on. But these people will need pharmacotherapy as well as the psychological treatments. So what do we have? Um, according to literature, the more you read, the less you there is. And this is the, the dilemma with ICE, is that there isn't really a set treatment for it, except the psychosocial treatment. So of course, put them there if you can, once they've stopped and they're not using and they're able after a few weeks, they're able to sit for a whole hour with a the therapist. Good. Let's let's give them um, give them counselling and um, CBT and so on. But uh, there is a stimulant treatment program. Um, there 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 is a couple of them in the state. Their actual substitution program, like I mentioned earlier, with the uh, this des dexamphetamine or Ritalin or. Um, these are at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney and in Newcastle. Uh, they're very small, uh, small number of people are admitted there. The admission criteria is very difficult and uh, the suitability criteria is, is very high. So it's difficult to admit people and the results haven't been that wonderful so far, but it suits some people. But for, for our um, purposes here, really counseling an outpatient is, is the main one, and some pharmacotherapy that I will mention in a minute. But there's also online and phone counseling, and especially f uh, treatments for, for the young people, for Aboriginal people. You need mental health input most of the time. The thing is, they don't like to see your patients while they're using. So the patients have to have been abstinent for many, many weeks before a psychiatrist or psychologist, which is fair enough. They, it's very difficult to treat an, act, treat an active user. And that's not only with ice, with, with any drug, including alcohol. Obviously, you um, can't refer them until they've been abstinent for a while. W with the phone and online counseling, there's a new trend now to have apps, especially on the phone. And that suits young people, especially who, who are tech savvy. Um, the one I know of uh, definitely is a, is a um, cannabis treatment program that, that can happen on, on, on the app. Um, have you heard of NICPIC, the organization that the uh, National Institute for Cannabis Research and Education is on? NICPIC, you can Google it. They've just been defunded, but I think their website is still active. And they offer um, uh, counseling on the phone or through, through the app. So they're, and they're, spe they're specializing in cannabis, but I'm not sure if there's an equivalent one in for us. Um, I know Smart Recovery does stuff for online, online treatment. Um, uh, so we have the self-help groups similar to the AA. The, so there's uh, Crystal Meth Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. And especially family support, it'll come in a minute. Um, uh, if we do the psychosocial intervention early before the person becomes fully dependent, it's more likely to be 
effective, and that's obviously self-explanatory. Um, it's better in occasional users before they become tolerant, and um, we need to always remember to address other drug use because often they go hand in hand, and even alcohol, especially alcohol probably, and benzodiazepines. I want to throw benzodiazepines in now. They are <laughs> Trish is smiling because she knows how, what, what an abhorrence I have for, for benzos and especially is, um, uh, uh, heavy duty short acting benzodiazepine like uh, Xanax. So for the GPs here in this room, please don't prescribe Xanax ever. Just send them to the psychiatrist and ask the psychiatrist politely not to, not to prescribe Xanax. Thankfully Xanax has gone, uh, Alprazolam is now um, Schedule 8 and it's difficult to prescribe. The doctor needs a special authority, but even long acting um, benzodiazepines are really not needed and they cause more trouble than, than good. And Although they tell us here that in the initial detoxification period, if you want to give the person something to relax them and help them cope with the, with the withdrawals, you could give them short, a short, sharp period of benzodiazepines. And uh, please don't write them a script for 50 tablets and let them go away. Um, keep it small. Uh, I prefer to use a medication called pericyzine, neolactyl. It does similar jobs without being a benzodiazepine. It doesn't go de cause dependence. It doesn't cause depression. Um, I always like to plug it. Trish probably heard it ten times from me, and I, I hope y you use it and you have good experience. Yes, um, it's it's good stuff. It's a gentle anti-anxiety drug. It's on the PBS. It's free and well, it's free for Aboriginal people, cheap for other people, six dollars, and it's um, it's very useful. It does the job. As long as people use it in that small dose, up to 20 milligrams a day, pericyzine is very good. But um, anyway, so these are the psychological treatments. Um, and I think I put this here for the benefit of the doctors and nurses here in, in the clinic. Don't be shy when you're assessing a patient to ask them about their drug use. But don't go straight away and tell them, ah, do you use ice? How much ice do you use and so on? They, they won't like you. Uh, because, because it's illegal and it's got a stigma and they're going to just straight away uh, resist. But, um, but, you know, while we're asking them about blood pressure and stuff and, and their family and take history and so on, I'll also ask them, do you smoke? Obviously, we have, to, we have to screen for smoking. It'll be negligent not to. And the next one is alcohol. Um, because they're legal drugs, you can um, ask about them straight away. But, um, and then you can ask about cannabis. I think it's a good idea to ask about dope. And while you're there, then you can go into heavier drugs like uh, prescribed opiates, benzodiazepines, and ask about ice. Uh, there's no reason why not. And don't be fooled by a um, person's appearance or level of education and so on. I've, I've got a patient. Um, I saw her on Monday in Kempsey. She's um, in her third episode of opiate treatment. She uh, dabbles with opiates, but her main drug, her favorite drug, is, is ice. Um, she's doing OK with methadone and hasn't touched opiates for, for months now, but she can't uh, stop using ice. And you look at her, there's this 50-year-old, good-looking, very respectable, well-dressed, well-spoken, lovely woman like any of us here, and she uses ice quite frequently. Her mental health is shit, of course, but she gets it together, <laughs> and she manages to <laughs> she manages to keep it together. Uh, and I said to her, what are we going to do? How's, how's your family? Yeah, good, the kids. Are you a grandmother yet? She said, coming on the way. Your first grandchild, yes, will be born whenever, soon. And I said, and you're still using ice? What, what, what are we going to do? What's going to happen when you know, when your grandchild, are you going to be able to see your grandkids grow and go to university and so on? Um, and that shocked her a bit. I don't know. Maybe I was rude to ask that, but uh, it wasn't very positive. But uh, there's this almost grandmother who, who you wouldn't think, uh, you know, you could socialize with her anywhere, and she uses ice. Uh, and it's not good for her. It is destroying her life. She's aware of it, but she's addicted. We're working on it. So please, ice, so screen for it. And, and screen for IV drug use and screen for bloodborne viruses. It's 
a much higher incidence, of course. Um, I'll just put this here to, to remind everybody. Um, and counseling does work, of course, but um, brief intervention, two to four sessions seem to be, th there is evidence that they work, and I know there's evidence for doctors to do a brief intervention. Even if you put in five minutes, 10 minutes, during a consult to talk about, I'll show you a little bit how you can do it. Really quickly, a few, a few questions and answers has been proven to be useful. People do listen to us, even if they didn't listen, but it, it, it sinks there, something stays there. Um, the earlier we do it, the better, and a few sessions. Uh, we can do mid-length or long-term therapy, um, residential rehab, good luck. If you can get a bed at rehab in New South Wales, within two or three weeks you'd have done really well. Very difficult to get a bed for rehab. Useful and important, but for some reason they're very hard to come by. I find it difficult to um, refer my, my patients to rehab and many of them don't like it anyway. Many patients resist going to rehab, although they need it. Uh, they can't afford it, they can't leave their home, they've got a mortgage or they're paying rent and they can't afford paying double rent and, and then there's no bed. But um, unfortunately, it is useful at times for long-term therapy. Mid-length therapy, uh, probably we should use um, the psychologists in town. Probably most doctors would refer to the better outcomes in mental health. We can do a mental health plan and get 10 sessions, and, and we can repeat them after a while. So that's very useful. You need to find the, I think it's a good idea when we do the mental health plan to definitely talk about drugs and ask the the therapist, the psychologist specifically to do CBT or other therapies to, to tackle the, the um, relapse prevention. The patient has been abstinent for so long, obviously that's a prerequisite. You wouldn't send anyone to psychologist before they've been abstinent, but if they've been abstinent and you're sending them there, please tell the, tell the psychologist what you want. Let them work on, on relapse prevention, work on the cravings and what cravings do and how they go away after half an hour and, and how people can um, learn skills to refuse and to say no to the drugs and so on. So there is specific treatment for drug relapse prevention and that's really important in ICE because ICE is, is a very, very strong psych drug and so the more we can work on the psyche the better. Uh, but we need the psychologists to be trained and to be able to do that. Um, and. Um, now this is the thing that we do best, us doctors, is to prescribe more drugs for drug users. And, but our drugs are hopefully good and they do more good than harm. Uh, and, and people like it, you know, the patient comes, they would much rather pop a pill once or twice a day than go and have sessions with a psychologist. But I think a bit of both is good. Let's combine them. Let's, let's give them that, that chemical prerequisite to help them relax, help them able to you know, their mood to be a bit more stable and help them to have the get up and go to the psychologist and keep the appointment with, with some pharmacotherapy. So let's do that. And there's nothing wrong with that, as long as it's not another addictive substance like, like Xanax. So don't do Xanax, um, nor, nor Valium if you can. Don't get me onto Valium. You know, you can buy, <laughs> doctors write a script for 200 tablets of Valium for $11. It costs the patient $11, a private script, non-PBS script. So first of all, it doesn't get registered at the doctor's shopper's hotline. And secondly, they go and sell it. Each tablet, they sell it for $5. So they get $1,000 out of $11 on the black market. It is possible now. So don't write big scripts, even if you have to write 10 tablets, just write 10 tablets. The chemist wouldn't dispense anymore. And if you really think the patient needs 50, get the chemist to dispense five or 10 at a time per week. You can tell the chemist, and most chemists would do it, they're pretty good. Just say, please dispense 14 tablets weekly or seven tablets weekly, and they would do it. So this, um, they've got a name for it, uh, controlled dispensing is, is quite okay. So let's not try it. 50 tablets of diazepam on the PBS, just like that, take it. Of course they will go and start popping it like lollies or selling it, but people get dependent on it. Diazepam is very uh, addictive, I think, especially when they're taking other drugs, so this is a problem, you know. Um, <laughs> so
So we can manage the symptoms of um, withdrawal or detoxification. This is where pericytosine comes in. Neolactyl. Uh, Neolactyl is an old antipsychotic drug. They used to use it apparently before we were born in high doses to treat psychosis, and probably 60 to 80 milligrams a day. We're going to use only 20 milligrams a day. And uh, it comes in 2.5 milligrams or 10 milligrams. I prefer to prescribe the 2.5. They get 100 tablets, and I tell them to use eight per day. So I say, get the sheet, cut up eight, tablet, uh, eight tablets, put them in your pocket, put the rest away, and use eight for that whole day. And I get them to use, use it the way they want, the way they feel, almost symptomatically, because it is rather short acting. Six to eight hours it works. So they can take it themselves when they feel agitated and anxious, and especially if they're hanging out, that, that withdrawal. It works really well for cannabis, because there's no treatment for cannabis. I assure you, I've been prescribing this for 15 years, people come back and say, it's really, really helping me for the cannabis, for the cravings for cannabis. It works. And the same thing for, for amphetamine. They use it in a um, couple of hospitals in Adelaide for amphetamine. They use it in the inpatient department. It's a nice, gentle anti-anxiety. Anti um, so up to 20 milligrams a day, eight tablets of the 2.5. Um, and I'm happy to repeat it, to write another couple of scripts. It's fine. I'm not worried about it. Um, so. Um, the brief counseling and the psychosocial, as mentioned, is most effective uh, who are dependent. And um, more treatment options. These are the, um, the psychotherapies that are obvious, um, that, that they use narrative therapy. I'm not sure what that is. They sit and tell stories, I guess. Uh, Self-help groups. And um, they say in number three, there's no pharmacotherapy. It's true. There is no actual. Um, uh, you know, accepted definite pharmacotherapy for it. I'm just going to look here. I've got some. Uh, no, nothing uh, except you know they for for the initial period you ask them to rest and drink lots of fluids and eat well and and not go partying and and so on in the um, in the initial detoxification period. Uh, so cognitive therapy, there's something called um, acceptance and commitment therapy. I'm not very good at it. Another one called contin contingency management, where people are given monetary incentives. Anyone knows about that? I'm not so sure. You give them $10 when they come to each session? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, they did meta-analyses and so on, and they found that it is useful in here. Um, but um, uh, we, we should always um, screen for bloodborne viruses and do brief interventions and so on, and then send them to the mental health. Um, I think these, are these things that we can do as GPs and, and nurse practitioners, and definitely practice nurses, they can do that. Just a little bit of this has got real impact. So. Um, if we, um, if we just ask them these questions, just, just like I did with the grandmother, you know, what's, what's good about it? It helps you get up and do work in the house and so on. Yes, good enough. But then what happens afterwards? So you point out to them the pros and cons of their drug use. And uh, uh, they, they like to hear that. They like to hear that we acknowledge that there is some benefit for them to use drug. This is, there's a reason for them to use it. They like using it. It takes away the depression. OK, well, let's think about your depression. How can we help you with that? Um, but then when they said, it gives me energy and I get up, what happens two days later? How do you feel then? And they all will tell you that they feel depressed and tired and lethargic and, and, and having problems afterwards. So we point out to them the pros and cons and let them think about it. And often, like George said earlier, we were chatting, let them tell us what they don't like about the drug. So we can elicit things to them. And there is one um, trick I've learned, not only for ice, but for other drugs. Uh, someone from England, psychologist, said um, they come and they, they're dependent on, say, say cannabis. And, they, and you say to them, um, how, um, you say to them um, how, much, how much would you like to give up cannabis use? How much out of 10, from 1 to 10, would you, would you like to give, give it up? And they would tell you, hmm, only two or three. So if they're not motivated, they're not, 
They, they're not motivated to, use, to, to give up. Uh, they give you a very low figure out of 10, obviously. Someone who really wants to give up will tell you 10. But people will tell you one or two. So, so say the person said, uh, only two out of 10 do I want to give up. And then what you ask them then is, why is it two? Why isn't it zero? And they will have to tell you why. So they will dig up from their brain a reason that what they don't like the drug about. You know? So they say, oh, it's costing me too much money, or my wife doesn't really like me to use. Um, so I give you two out of 10. So you, you, you squeeze out from them something negative about the drug use. If you have time, of course, it takes a bit of time. But um, I always talk to them about avoidance skills. So, which means avoid the drug, avoid the people who use, don't walk into a house where people are using, and if, if they are, just walk straight out. Don't let them to bring, bring it in your house. Uh, delete the number of your phone, and if they're ringing you and hassling you or giving you or selling you, change your phone or block them. So there are simple ways, just practical ways to avoid it because, at least initially, because otherwise they will relapse. So we're trying to get them not to relapse and how to say no to it, even if it came their way, how to say no. And I say sometimes, stand in front of the mirror and practice and tell them to piss off. You don't want to see them um, if, if, if they've got drugs with them. It's a way to avoid it and to learn how to say no. And, and to um, the relapse prevention, you can read more about it if you like where you can talk about the cravings, how the craving comes like a wave, but then it goes away anyway. Even if you didn't do anything, the craving will, will subside. And as long as people know that, they can be reassured that uh, they're, not, they're not slaves to the cravings. The cravings come in waves, comes and goes. And um, how to get up and do other things and get distracted and go and drink water or go for a run or a bike ride or even drink someone they love in Perth and just talk about something else, just to take their mind off it. So distraction is good when the cravings come. Um, we're talking about the time when the person has already stopped, okay? So these people have stopped using and, and, and we don't want them to relapse. Um, these things we all can do in the practice. And it doesn't take long. I know our time is short. Most, most GPs have got nine minutes per person. Otherwise, they can't pay the bills of the practice. But even in nine minutes, if we keep seeing them once a week, we can do some stuff. Um, and then refer them to the drug and alcohol unit. So people who are highly dependent and who need treatment, we're happy to have from you. So ring that 1300 number that Linda has mentioned and uh, they, will, um, they will help you with it. Or send them to mental health. Um, and I always write down that I've done that. It's very easy, I've learned these few things. I say, I've educated, informed, and discouraged and warned. So these four things, it's very quick to write. You actually do that, but you don't have to write in detail in your notes ex everything you said. But if you write these four words, you've explained to them, you explain to the person about frying their brain. I use that word, fry your brain, very often, by the way. And it's true, it's literally frying the brain. I'll show you some in a minute. Um, about the risk of stroke, of infarct, ending up on a, on a wheelchair because they've had a stroke, being, going to the loony bin, I use the word loony bin, it's, I know it's not politically correct, but you know, going to the psychiatric hospital, and that's very common. And um, not to mention um, legal problems and social problems and fighting with their families and, and um, the legal impact. Very high proportion of people who end up in jail have done so due, due to drug use. Very, very high drug use in, in jails, as you can imagine. More and more uh, with ICE and um, uh, also Xanax, as it happens. One, one day, I can never forget, I went to Kempsey Jail on a Wednesday. I worked there, used to work there every Wednesday. And I had four patients out of about 10 that day who ended up in jail because of Alprazolam use, believe it or not. I don't know. It, it happens. It, it, it sent them almost crazy. People lose touch with reality. They go into this deep sedation. They don't have to go to sleep. They're still awake, but they almost um, dissociate from reality, and they do silly things, and they commit crime, and they end up in jail. Obviously, it wouldn't be El President by itself. There would have been other problems there, but um, it's one of the problems. So, um, if you like, El President is almost the the flip side of the coin of, of ICE. 
Alprazolam is short, deep, deep acting benzodiazepine and short acting. So it puts them in sedation and then within six hours or less, they go to the, op obviously they go into withdrawal, which is the opposite effect of, of, of benzos, which is this. It's almost as though they've taken some ice, the, the coming down of the, of the alprazolam. This is a simple way of putting it. This is what I've learned over the years. It's like the two almost go hand in hand. Not to mention that the patients themselves do both. To come down off one, they use the other. Uh, they can get too tired with too much alprazolam use over the years, so they use ice and vice versa. But it's usually, usually uh, diazepam they use to relax or alcohol to, to manage to cope with the, with the ice use. Okay, so I write these four words in the notes. And this is a little blurb about working with families because you could imagine that methamphetamine is, is a big family drug. Anyone seen that uh, series on ABC, Ice Wars? Uh, I can never forget this mother who was saying that she had to go to the toilet and carry her bag with her, worried that her son would steal her money. Wasn't that impressive? It was so strong because, yes, people just destroy their families' lives and their parents' lives and their partners and their kids and so on. It's very destructive, unfortunately. Um, so the families need support. Uh, there is an organization called Family Drug Support, which is a wonderful organization that supports families of people who use drugs. Uh, available online, just Google them. And most towns have got uh, a center, a committee. I know there's one in Port Macquarie and none in Kempsey. I'm not sure if some in, in Coffs. It was um, founded by a man, lovely man called Tony Trimmingham, who lost his son many, many years ago to, to an overdose. And uh, Tony is a very positive, active man who didn't want to just lose his son. So he founded this organization called Family Drug Support to support families who use drugs. Um, and um, they're very good. They have uh, training programs and so on for families, for parents and partners of drug users. Um, so look them up if you like. Um, uh, intoxicated people, they can come and cause havoc in the surgery. Uh, be aware that they're not. They, 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 you can't reason with them. They're intoxicated. They're impaired. So we will um, have a... Um, a problem interacting with them and we just have to stay calm and keep the environment calm and I don't know what we can do if it happened in the middle of the waiting room in a, in, in a GP surgery but um, you know take them aside and calm them and relax them uh, or call the ambulance and the police. I think uh, a really quick first aid is uh, a bit of Zyprexa, olanzapine wafer 10 milligram does, does wonders. And that's what they would use in the emergency department, unless they have to use parenteral, um, unless the person refuses to take anything. So probably um, oral five milligram of diazepam, five or 10, and um, uh, Zyprexa wafer, it's, it's quite quick acting. Otherwise, in the emergency department, they probably do draw peridol or something heavy like that, IV, to, if, if they're um, psychotic. Uh, so it can be a real problem. So yeah, drop peridol. The protocol is uh, repeated in 15 minutes time, IMI, um, and or oral diazepam or olanzapine. They're useful stuff for, for emergencies when they're intoxicated. And this is what happens to Homer Simpson. That's what happened to him after um, many years of, of drug use. In his case, it's beer and hamburgers, but... Um, uh, some of the uh, centers where different drugs work. But um, really, it's that frontal lobe here where, um, where the whole problem lies. It's, uh, it's the one they're finding uh, gets damaged with early drug use before the age of 20, because it takes up to 20, 25 years for this almost to, uh, to uh, mature. And that's where also the problem happens with mothers using when they're pregnant. Um, look, this is really interesting. Have a look at this. Um, I got this from a Professor Curry, John Curry, one year when he was working in Sydney. And 
uh, straight away it just hit me. Look at the circle on top on the left. This is a normal person or, or animal, rats probably. And this is what happens when they're dependent on any type of stimulant. And look at the, the spines on the neuron, on, on, on the dendrites of the neuron. We all have these spines, and this is where they connect to other neurons. The, the red neurons connecting to, the, to our spines, and this is how the neurotransmitters work, you know, between one neuron and another. This is why our brain is so wonderful. There's billions of them, and there's a constant flow of neurotransmitters. But when people become dependent on stimulants, these little spines become much more abundant, so that the total surface area of these dendrites is much, much bigger, tenfold. So you can imagine this brain just sitting there, hyper excited and ready to, and, and working much faster and much more intensely. And this is proven in this photograph. It's micrograph, electron microscopy with between the two. So the middle one, this is low magnification. This, these two are high magnification. The middle one is normal. And the last one is um, when they subjected the, the mouse, I think, to um, cocaine and see how much more uh, uh, rich the dendrites are. And this is what happens to the brain. And the big question is, does this recover after they stop? Does it go back to normal? I'm wondering. I think not. So there's a worry about this might be one of the few drugs that can cause permanent damage, permanent changes in the brain, depending, of course, how early they've used and how much and how long for. But um, it's a real concern about the brain being fried, whether it's fried beyond repair. I'm not sure. I have to throw this here. I've already talked about benzodiazepines. Uh, but the, the opioids we prescribe are, and we put it in perspective. I mean, many more people use opioids than, than um, stimulants. But uh, the problem is there are more people now dying of opioids overuse than, than heroin on the street. Heroin comes and goes, but uh, the scripts that we give out, especially OxyContin, uh, is much more uh, guilty for a lot of the harm being done with uh, and fentanyl patches they are not safe they are not harmless people can scrape scrape them or sometimes boil the whole thing and extract the fentanyl it's it's one of the uh, very very um, potent opiates and it's uh, there's a lot of overdoses happening from fentanyl so don't prescribe them very easily. If you really want to prescribe something, if you have to go, go Norspan patches, the buprenorphine patches, they're safe and they're much nicer and there's very little black market for them and, and they last for a whole week. And buprenorphine being a partial agonist is much safer. So I just thought I'd put this here because it's obviously much more harmful than, than ice in, you know, in, um, uh, in volume at least. So more deaths than in heroin, um, and the more opiates we use, the more hyperalgesia. So people, you know, long-term treatment for pain is is not really solved by with with opiates uh, because the more opiates we give them, the more pain they will get probably because of the hyperalgesia. Not to mention the tolerance that the brain gets, and um, uh, non-cancer pain is definitely not to go. This is nice. I got this um, from a source who got it from the uh, NPS, National Prescribing Service. And uh, Kempsey comes right up on top. Yes, that's us. Uh, Coffs Harbor comes so, sort of similar to, to Broken, Head, Broken Hill. And look at Sydney, quite low. I don't know why. They probably have other drugs they party with. But, um, but we prescribe a lot of opiates in the country probably because there's shortage of doctors and we can't afford the time. There's, and, and people come in and they, they say, ah, oh, yeah, I've got it prescribed and I need it. I've got chronic pain here and there. And, and the best way to get rid of someone like that is to write them a script and they go away. 
Um, I use always the, the authority system and I get, I ring that authority and I write and get authority and so on and use that as a bit of a buffer between me and the patient to control, control this and, and I always get them to go to the chemist at least once a fortnight if not once a week to pick it up and I don't give them the whole box and so on and, uh, and only after I've known them and seen them and I won't do it on the first visit so please think of that. Um, also from the National Prescribing Service. So oxycodone is a big problem causing deaths. Um, um, you can read all that. Unlike heroin users, they're more likely to have started an opiate for pain. So there's a lot of overlap between real pain and addiction. And please don't uh, s subscribe to the idea that one person is genuinely in pain and another person is an addict. Uh, they do that a lot in the emergency department. They put a sharp line between the two. One is good, one is bad. It's not like this. There's a big overlap. Mo most people who are now addicted to opiates have started off with, with pain. And they were given, they started off with endone in the emergency department and, and then uh, codeine phosphate. And before we know it, they've gone to Oxycontin and then fentanyl and then, and then they um, want more and they doctor shop and when one doctor cuts them off they go and buy heroin on the street or they buy fentanyl tablets on the black market and then they come, if they're lucky they come to the methadone program and we treat them. There's about 80% of people on the methadone program in, in KMC and Port Macquarie who've started off like this in, in real pain. So a big overlap between, between genuine pain and addiction and I wonder if you and I would not become junkies if this happened to us, had a big car accident, motor, motorbike accident and ended up in chronic pain and, and became addicts. So um, it does make, make our job more difficult as doctors and puts a lot of responsibility on us. Um, uh, NPS again, 14 million prescriptions for opiate medication in one year and that's in Australia only. 14 million. Like, there's only 21 million of us, <laughs> two, two thirds of, it's crazy, uh, was 10 times higher in the area of the highest rate than the lowest rate. So big, big uh, discrepancy between different areas in Australia. Uh, no explanation for it. Uh, over the counter, that's another problem. That's gonna change though. I believe there's new rules happening soon, sometime this year or next year, middle of this year, I think. Uh, no more uh, Nurofen Plus or Panadine or Panadine strong painkillers and stuff. Those that contain codeine phosphate, they all need a script now. People can't just go and buy them. I, I think that's true. I think I heard it. I July. July, yes. Yes, yes. Which is good because a lot of it has been abused. Chris knows. You, lots of people on Suboxone come from, from that. They've never injected, they just go. Two main ones is ibuprofen and paracetamol combined. Look, 15 milligrams of paracetamol, 70, 80, imagine. So 70 times 15 milligrams of codeine every day. The worry is the damage done by the paracetamol as well. <coughs> Handfuls at a time. Uh, so I've already done that. <laughs> <laughs> I left it to the end. <laughs> I won't say any more. So these are figures from our area, 15, 16. These are um, drug and alcohol um, admissions treatment. Obviously the outpatient, you know, when, when patient comes, they get asked what's their drug of choice or why they came. And these, these are the different drugs in different areas. So there's... Um, Coffs Harbor here, um, the majority, the big chunk, about probably a, a third uh, is alcohol. Um, then come the opioids and the cannabis. The purple one is um, the amphetamines. So 6.8 in Coffs Harbor um, of the people who came for treatment, came for amphetamines. Um, in KMC uh, by itself only uh, also 6.8, although it looks a bit smaller, the, the graph. In KMC and Port Macquarie together, it's 9.5, a bit higher. Um, that's the purple bit. Uh, 
opioids always, m many more in Kempsey, more opioids, but as you can see, alcohol is still the major one. Uh, so they still use relatively low amphetamines, but uh, the majority of users are, uh, do take other drugs as well. The majority, of, sorry, the majority of them use it less than monthly, uh, which is like 70% of the people, but um, the use is, has got high impact, high rate, and because the purity and the strength of, of the drug is getting bigger, the price is going, uh, going down and it's more available and support is available and the treatment does work. So please... Uh I'd like to say thank you to Farris. It was an excellent, excellent talk and it really helped me.